24. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast from Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Delosky? Present. Ms. Lichter? Present. Please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Di Donato? Present. Ms. Myers? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Wicks? Ms. Blotner? Present. Dr. Biancoli? Present. Ms. Wise? Present. Thank you. Um, are there other staff members participating in today's meeting, Ms. Cox, or are we good? I think we're good. Okay. Um, committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names and committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee members will move and say their name and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote? And Ms. Cox will then speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately. Okay, thank you everybody for being here um, for this meeting that we um, added. First on the agenda is textbooks, anthology for English courses, grades six to 12. This item has been presented and discussed many times um, at previous board meetings, and you also had a chance to view the PowerPoint that was on board docs. So at uh, this time, I would like to make a motion to recommend the textbook anthology for English courses, grades six through 12 to be recommended to the Building and Contracts Committee. Do I have a second for that motion? And then we'll take questions. Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Are there any um, further questions on this contract? Okay, I don't think I see anybody or hear anybody. So with that, may we have a roll call vote, Ms. Cox? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Damanowski? Yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that recommendation will go to buildings and contracts. Um, the same thing for our next one, the ESOL curricula assessments and materials of instruction, grades six through 12. We've had this um, multiple times in the past, as well as information on the PowerPoint. So um, at this time, I would like to make a motion to recommend the ESOL curricula assessments and materials of instruction grades six through 12. Is there a second? Second, Stolesky. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, hearing none, I, can we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? You're on mute, Ms. Cox. I'm sorry, I lost. I, I'm sorry, I lost my. Um, um, Ms. Pumphrey. No worries. Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes. Ms. Dominowski. Yes. Ms. Delosky. Yes. Ms. Lichter. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Again, that recommendation will go to buildings and contract. The third agenda item is the Institute of Multisensory Education Comprehensive Orton-Gillingham. I think we keep hearing it as ISME. 
Again, we have also discussed this multiple times, as well as having more information um, presented through board docs. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the contract for IMSE Comprehensive Horton Gillingham. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there was two seconds, uh, Ms. Cox, either Ms. Stolesky or um, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes. At this time, are there any further questions? There were a lot of questions that were sent in before, prior. If we could get the answers to those. Okay. Um, Dr. DiDonato? Sure. So, um, just so that uh, our viewing audience are aware of questions, the first one was um, why is women's OG not included in the presentation? Um, this is truly a presentation for this contract. So, the contract is for IMS at IMSE, um, Comprehensive Orton Gillingham uh, Professional Development Program. And so it was isolated to just that. Um, and previously we had given information about the two um, just to give context. So um, this was truly moving forward with just that. Um, is IMSE OG a general education curriculum or tier three intervention? Um, they have a phonics program that is Orton based in Orton Gillingham methodologies, it can be used as a tier one or core instructional program, which would be whole group, large phonics instructional program that's multi-sensory. It also can be used because we've talked before about the difference between tier two and tier three, that part of that is related to the intensity. So intensity can be looking at group size um, and duration, the instructional period, how long a student uh, receives something or the frequency, so the additional days. And it also has to do with the specificity of the diagnostic. You're not just going through page by page in a sequence. You're doing pre-assessments, you're doing benchmark assessments and progress monitoring of the student. So the program is tailored to where the student is. It's not just like going through a kindergarten program. So that's the distinction between those. Um, is the intent to uh, intention with this contract to replace Bowman's OG with IMSE? Um, our goal is to move forward with a single vendor who's providing training in the Orton Gillingham methodology um, and the resources and materials that align with that methodology. Um, if approved, it would be used in lieu of the Orton, uh, the Bowman's Orton Gillingham contract. Um, will the IMSE? district instructor, once fully certified, be responsible for training our special educators. I'm going to take this question and expand it a little bit because the training wouldn't just be isolated to special educators. We have reading specialists and reading resource teachers and reading teachers who may be the provider and of services for a student who's receiving um, Orton Gillingham. So the district trainer would train um, BCPS teachers. However, we would still need to use the vendor. The size of our district makes it prohibitive for any single one person to do training. Plus, what we're really looking for this individual to do is provide that coaching and that on the ground in the classroom support. So if a student is struggling or if we're seeing trends with data that are not moving in a positive direction or it looks like a student is stalling in progress, then this person could go work with the teacher, could observe, could model, and could coach through some of those things to figure out what do we need to do to kickstart learning for that student again? So it wouldn't be isolated to special educators and we would still, no matter what we have, need a vendor just by our sheer size um, and because the amount of training that we would want someone to have. Um, so will special educators receive additional or tier three intervention specific training? What additional um, specific training will they receive to teach our students who need tier three? Um, I'm going to take this a little bit to the other question that it wouldn't necessarily be a special educator. Um, we have some highly skilled, incredibly trained reading specialists, and if that is the most skilled person in that school building um, to provide this, that's who we would provide. Um, that's who we would have provide services to a student. Um, I am going to pass to uh, Dr. Kraft for a moment to talk a little bit more about the training and support because she also can give some information about what current training expectations are. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so 
By the end of June, our goal is to have 65 paraeducators trained in the educational assistant course. Again, their role is not to provide that first instruction, but to assist teachers that are fully trained in OG um, to work um, either as they are receiving OG instruction um, or to provide that continuity um, in the classroom as students are receiving their tier one, that they can provide that same language and structured literacy approach. Um, by the end of August, we want to have um, an additional 64 teachers trained um, in OG. Um, and by the fall, anybody that has been trained in um, the MZ OG um, will have either completed letters, um, third edition, or they will take the phonological awareness course um, so that they would have additional hours. Um, and I think we've talked before that um, letters third edition um, is 90 hours um, in specifically foundational skills, um, both in theory and in practice, um, that would give them additional um, knowledge as they implement OG. Um, then what we uh, want to do is launch another 60 participants in um, for OG for um, either new teachers that have come in to our district or sometimes a need arises with a student and so maybe we didn't train or have enough trained um, participants so we have specifically set aside a set number of seats so that we can be specifically responsive to any um, unmet needs that need to um, that we need to provide training for um, and so what we also will be doing is by um, fall 2024, so this coming fall, administrators will have had the opportunity to be trained um, in the observation and support of OG instruction. Um, by this winter, we will have a, um, a, dist a fully certified district instructor to support um, the implementation of OG um, at both the macro and the micro level to ensure that we are helping students that might have gotten stuck to get unstuck, um, to, uh, to continually monitor the data that we will be collecting. Um, we are moving to a new um, data collection system um, to ensure that we are really monitoring and providing students what they need in the moment, that we don't ever allow too much time to go by. Um, and so that will launch this fall. Um, and then in fall of 2024, um, we will communicate those mandatory benchmarks um, for students receiving um, any tier two or three um, instruction. But of course, uh, since we're focused on OG, for OG, OG, um, what that will have to, what that progress monitoring looks like, um, so that it can be monitored at the district level, and um, and then in 2024, 2025. Um, any newly hired elementary reading specialist will have to have participated in letters. Um, and for um, reading specialists already sitting in that position, um, they have the 24-25 school year to get trained in volume one. Um, and then in the 25-26 uh, school year, um, volume two. Um, so that will be 180 hours of science of reading training for our reading specialist. Um, and that allows us to ensure that all of our reading specialists have deep knowledge on how to be literacy and language experts on the science of reading to help our most vulnerable students. Um, and so we really do have a multifaceted approach to ensure that uh, we are providing training to everyone um, and not in this year one, but in year two, uh, we uh, plan to also put in place um, requirements for um, the um, person that's been designated the 1.0 at the secondary level as the reading teacher that they will also begin. They have a choice of uh, letters or aims. Uh, both uh, provide that um, deep foundational knowledge aligned to the science of reading. Um, and so uh, all of these things will combine together to really provide um, teachers with deep knowledge so that they can make those micro decisions that they have to make in the moment uh, when a student becomes stuck to help them get unstuck. Thank you. Thank Dr. Donato, were there other questions on that list? No, that was the end of that, those questions. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from board members? Ms. Stolesky? Thank you. Um, thank you for all of your specifics about um, the training and the timeline for the training. Um, 
I just think it's important for um, families of the dyslexic population to really understand the change in the training from the, I believe it was 60 hours to 30 hours and, um, you know, exactly what that will mean for their children. Um, I know that um, there was an email that came through, I don't know, a day or so ago, and um, they expressed some concerns at the end. They just wanted to understand or they expressed the importance of understanding just the impact of the change in the the hours in the training on the services that uh, their children would receive. So if you, if you wouldn't mind just um, diving into that um, so that everybody can understand, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely, and and thank you. We always welcome questions, um, and I I would just want to start the this response with I think we all want the same thing. We want all of our students to be able to read, and we know the research tells us that ninety five percent of our students can. Um, achieve a proficiency level in reading. And so that is our goal. And I will tell you, quite honestly, we are very far from that goal at this point, but we are putting some very specific action steps in place to help lessen that. Um, but to get to your specific question, um, I actually, um, I, I wanted to add one more detail. So I said by winter of 25, we would have that fully um, certified district instructor. Um, but the what's really exciting in school year 25-26, the district instructor will be full time at the district level office um, serving as a coach to help ensure integrity of implementation of OG, um, which can include providing initial training, but understanding that's just a drop in the bucket. Um, really, it's going to be providing that differentiated support based on the progress monitoring data over time. Um, and so I wanted to start there, but I do want to um, uh, go more deep into your question. And actually, I have Nicole Wise with me today, um, who has actually participated in um, the training. And I want her to talk a little bit about her experience with the training um, and how it um, has um, equipped her to provide OG instruction to her students. And I just want also um, to also reiterate that that 30 hours is the base not the ceiling. And in fact, we are lifting that ceiling way up um, more so than we ever have in terms of what we're expecting as base knowledge for anyone that's providing intervention to our students and certainly um, our students that have reached a tier three intervention. And so earlier you heard Dr. Diodano say, well, you know, sometimes it might be the special educator and sometimes it might be the reading specialist who has a master's in reading and has participated in another 180 hours around the science of reading. And so we are making sure that we're making instructional decisions that serve our um, students um, that need the most support with the right individual in front of them. And so um, I'm going to actually ask Nicole if you wanted to talk, Ms. Wise, if you want to talk a little more about um, your experience with the training and, um, and to just speak honestly if that um, has given you what you need to implement um, OG in the classroom with your students. Sure, um, I'd be happy to. So I am the reading specialist at Honeygo Elementary, and um, I was first trained by Fran Bauman in the summer of 18, 2018. And, you know, I just want to start by saying that she is basically the person who inspired me to continue my Orton Gillingham trainings. Um, we even spoke about, you know, working in retirement with her, and um, I, I did learn so much from her. As far as the 60 hours, um, Fran did do a lot of talking with us about her journey in becoming a teacher, special educator, how she um, she has advocated and worked so hard for Maryland Law and our Ready to Read Act and to support families of students that have dyslexia. So, you know, she has done so much work around this. Um, but as far as 60 hours, I have to say that comparing the 30 hours, um, the number like quantity versus quality kind of comes into mind because the 30 hours was very intense and specific. With Fran's program, like I said, she spoke with us a lot. We had to take notes. Um, I have my notes back here in a binder. Um, she did give us a flash drive that had her program on it and it contains a phonological awareness activity. 
it contains about 10 words that you would have children read in isolation with that skill. So for example, SH would have words that would have SH, and then it had two sentences for us to read. And then she gave us a decoding supplement and they had these little stories that she had written. They were just typed out. And so we weren't allowed to copy or print any of those things for students. Um, so we as teachers had to come back into the schoolhouse and write it on our board or write it on, um, she said you could use white paper and write out the words and have kids draw a picture of it. So the materials were um, a little bit lackluster. We had to kind of do everything on our own, except for, you know, she did give us a few examples of words to use. So we found ourselves, I'm speaking on behalf of the other reading specialists here, so we found ourselves constantly looking at other resources to try to supplement um, Fran's resources. And of course, they were not controlled text or safe resources because her program follows a different scope and sequence as do most phonics programs. So then, um, you know, I still implemented the program, had success with it. I love the methodology of the multi-sensory techniques that she taught us. Um, I went to Loyola and did that for nine days. And then I was trained in MC last summer, and that was a 30-hour course. It started on the screen at 8 in the morning, and we finished at 3.30. And we had two, like, six or seven-minute breaks and a 30-minute lunch, I mean, a 45-minute um, lunch. But it was very, very intense, and um, we had opportunities to, um, we had to have our screen down all the time so the instructor could see us, and then we went into breakout rooms, and we had to teach each component of the lesson as we learned that lesson. The vast majority of materials that were provided with MC is amazing. Um, one key component that we came back into the schoolhouse and with Fran's program, we didn't have any assessment or progress monitoring resources. Um, MC does provide um, benchmark resources. So beginning of the year, midterm and final for K through three. Um, so that has been helpful. They have built-in progress monitoring that you can use with their decodable passages every week. They have a spelling inventory. Um, they have a syllabication guide, um, but you can see I have everything in behind me. That's actually one of my lessons from today. Um, the vast amount of resources and the explicit instruction that teachers are provided through MC has been um, very good for my students this year. As a matter of fact, I'm currently in the practicum and started the district training this week, and my students have just made leaps and bounds, and the amount of data that I've been able to collect um, with their progress has just been exponential compared to what I was able to collect with France. We had, like I said, we had to create our own little progress monitoring lists along the way. So, you know, when I compare 30 versus 60, um, the time on task and the materials and everything that was provided through MC has been more helpful to me as an educator. And so I do want to acknowledge that um, Billman has added progress monitoring in now, but if you were trained before that point, um, you know, you don't necessarily know or have access to it. Um, however, she does have refresher courses. And so um, certainly I just wanted to state that um, progress monitoring has been added, but um, Ms. Wise was in a, a cohort prior to progress monitoring being added in. Um, and Ms. Wise, thank you so much for, for talking about that a little bit as a practitioner. Um, and then, you know, I do want to, you know, reiterate that we are, um, always trying to increase um, the the knowledge of student of teachers that are delivering instruction to our most vulnerable students, and so um, we have a um, at this point a three year plan and benchmarks for each of those years. We will be monitoring those benchmarks, um, which includes ensuring that there are you know enough instructors at. Um, each site um, to meet the needs of the students that need to be served. And so uh, we do have a very robust plan in place, and we're really excited about um, moving forward um, to make sure that students get exactly what they need and that teachers have exactly what they need to implement um, with fidelity um, and with the ability to um, feel that they have everything they need to be successful. Um, would it be okay if I asked a follow-up question? Yes, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that information, um, this new 30 hour training, it's wonderful to hear that it's more efficient for sure. Um, does it specifically address um, some of the special ed specific needs such as dyslexia versus it's just a general tier three intervention for struggling readers. So if you could dive into a little bit how it specifically supports populations such as dyslexia and other special ed needs, that would be great. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah, of course. Thank you for that follow-up question. I'm yeah. going to let Ms. Y start um, talking about the OG Comprehensive Plus, and then I've um, um, also uh, done that, but I've also done the morphology. Um, and so I'm going to let her start, and then I'll add into you know what we did what we um, did in morphology. So Ms. Wise, do you want to talk a little bit about your perspective of um, sure. the, spe the specificity of of attending to special needs and dyslexia? Absolutely. Um, you can even see with the training manual in front of me, um, just reading off some of the table of contents, introduction, current research, structured literacy, structure of the English language, multi-tiered system of support. It explains all of that. Dyslexia, there's a whole chapter on that. Students with disabilities, English language learners, meeting the needs of all learners, adaptations and assistive technology, um, suggested readings on websites, or in Gillingham at a glance, guidelines for lessons. So it starts off, it's basically a whole manual and you, you can kind of see all of my but common symptoms of dyslexia it has charts um, it goes very much into like structured literacy and all of the details and ways that you can serve um, students that have dyslexia and you know there are other books that we had suggested readings as a matter of fact um Sally Shaywitz, The Overcoming Dyslexia, mm -hmm. which is like a 550 um, page book that was extremely helpful, um, understanding the logic of English. So there are other resources that have been provided for me to dig deeper, but the training manual itself and within the training, the multi-sensory approach certainly focuses on students that have dyslexia and has given me a much better and deeper understanding. And um, I'll just add, thank you so much, Ms. Wise. And I'll just You're add, welcome that um, you, Orton Gillingham as a methodology was developed particularly, um, and at one point they called, you know, there were things thrown around like letter blindness, but really to understand students that were struggling with um, letter okay. sounds, letter names, um, being able to, you know, um, read effectively and efficiently. And so the whole methodology is based on really addressing the needs of uh, of students with dyslexia. Um, and so just understanding that the that's what the approach is rooted in is for that. And then I'm just going to add on a little bit um, everything um, that Ms. Wise said um, for the OG Comprehensive Plus. And then I've also taken morphology. Um, and what I'll say is that they really get into the needs of um, older struggling readers. And for me, that was super important because it's not the same to teach a, a struggling, um, a striving reader that's six years old versus a, a striving reader that's 16 years old. It's it's very different. It's very complex. And understanding um, the needs of adolescent um, striving readers is really important. And so they did add that layer. Um, I also read um, the entire book, which gave a, 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 a huge, it just, it broadened my knowledge. Um, the other thing about the 30 hours is there's, um, there's, there's homework every single night that you have to complete before before coming in the next day. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that 30 hours is our base. Um, and when I say base, remember, we are now requiring that everyone takes that phonological awareness course or letters, right? They can do either in the beginning, right? Because we realize we have to phase it in. Our goal is that anybody that has been trained up to this point, which is about 158 through MZ, um, will either have taken letters, and we know that there's about 58 of them that have been in letters, third edition, um, or the phonological awareness by the fall. So before they're implementing this fall, that they will have that additional either 12.5 phonological awareness or they will have been through letters. And so that's our commitment um, is that we are going to continue to add to that 30 hours. Um, and, and moving forward, our base is, meaning required together, is that they have to do, if they're not in letters, which is going to be where we're moving towards, that they have to do the comprehensive plus and the phonological awareness and that's the before you get in front of kids and that's going to be the the base of what we expect and so um did that answer your question or was there a part i missed 
No, thank you. That was very okay. helpful. Okay, thank you. Janie, you're muted. Ms. Lichter, sorry. Ms. Demonowski, did is your hand up again or did you not put it down on it? Yeah, I, I just had a couple of follow-ups. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Um so the thing I, I researched this and I, I really think it's a great um general ed program. I, I wish it we had gone through this when we were um looking at HMH and the learning. Uh I think uh my problem I'm having is that the Bowman's OG with the 60 hours is specifically for dyslexic students who are our most vulnerable in a very small setting to working one on one with a special educator or um, a literacy advocate. And this for this to be the completion of this is just the 30 hours. And I hear that it's intensive. Um, I'm just I don't understand. I, I want to see how this is going to help even our older um, students with dyslexia there's not a lot it's a it's very geared towards k through two and then there's not a lot moving forward and we are we're replacing a very intensive tier three intervention with something that is meant and it's a great curriculum I, I have no problems with this curriculum i just have a problem understanding the intention of replacing something as intensive as Bowman's OG with our most vulnerable with something that's more geared towards a general ed um, classroom setting. So Mr. Domanowski, is there a question? Is there a question or just was that a comment? That's a question. Why uh, can you um, explain to me why how this is going to replace something as intensive as the Bowman's OG that works through, you know, K through 12th graders with something that is more general ed classroom setting as this uh, IMSE. So okay, both Bowman and uh, both Bowman and IMSE provide training in the Orton Gallingham methodology. They both do. Um, the, they're Resources are there's lots of similarities between them. There's differences between scope and sequence along the way, but it is they are both training programs for Orton Gillingham methodology. It is not replacing training for Orton Gillingham. It is a one vendor versus a different vendor, and that's it. It is both of them are uh, multi sensory, both of them are. Uh, tiered with the methodology and resources as far as helping students um, you know break down sounds understand the correlation between sounds and letter symbols blending them together they are both doing all of those pieces so it's not a replacement it's a different vendor um and and just to add on thank you dr didonato and just to add on uh miss dominowski um i did and this is just part of my process when we're looking at any program is you know i reach out to districts and it's always the ones they don't list in their you know um little uh you know rfp i you know try to find authentically like you know through somebody through somebody you know i know a lot of people um you know to see who are using it and i talked to um you know a, a school district in in texas and what they said to me was that um, all of their students um, it, that have dyslexia are using the MZ program, and she said that they are all um, what they categorize as tier three. Um, and I had reached out to a, another contact in um, Ohio who is using it with, with older kids with much success um, and said this is the first time that she's really seen significant movement. And so um, I hear at the, the heart of what you're saying, and the last thing we want to do is reduce um, anything for our students. Um, in fact, I would I would agree with you that they need more. It's just I think that we have to say, what is the more? Is it is it the um, structure? Is it the materials? Is it the, that they have an, you know, an in-district coach, you know? And so I think that, I think at the heart of what we're both saying is I think we agree on a lot. And, and so we are not trying to remove any services from students. What we are trying to do is really help um, close gaps. And some of these gaps are staying 
much wider than I, I really want to see. And I want to start to see some really good movement for our students. And so, you know, for me, um, I, when I, I, and I know that you all know I've taught at elementary, middle, and high, but it was really when I went to middle school, um, and I know it sounds so silly because it's like not an aha at all, but I was a cross-categorical resource teacher. And so we were doing a very innovative model where I co-taught in English and social studies and science. And so I went to my principal and I said, well, the reason they're failing social studies and science is they can't read. And I know that sounds so basic, but I was I was a young baby teacher. So for me, it was a very big thing. Um, and so anyway, I started, you know, pulling them and things like that. But that's really when I went back to get my master's in reading was I really wanted to understand what happens when our students hit secondary school. So my interest in literacy actually wasn't um, really out of the elementary level, but was really out of our secondary students. And so my goal is to reduce the number of our uh, students that are moving to secondary school that need um, that have such a big gap. We want to reduce that gap. And so um, we are not changing the methodology. We're still staying rooted at Norton Gillingham. And we are trying to find a structure um, that we can make sure that we can um, that teachers are delivering with fidelity and have the resources that they need and that there are additional training opportunities over time as we continue to develop their knowledge base. So one other thing, the the Wilson reading system, which we brought forward, was that, um, you know, train the trainer type curriculum as well? Uh, no, great question. So Wilson requires a district um, certified instructor. The person we had trained for that um, did retire. Um, and so we have not replaced that district um, certified instructor. It does take a big, significant commitment to move forward. And so currently, um, at the secondary level, um, when you look at tier three uh, for uh, phonics decoding, uh, they can either have OG or Wilson. And, and, and honestly, depending on the educator that you talk to, um, they will you know, argue which one is more effective. Um, but at the, bottom, at the end of the day, the bottom line is what is moving the student forward? And that's why when I talked a little bit at the beginning about the progress monitoring data, this will be the first time that we're requiring it at the district level. They have to put it into performance matters so that we can really, you know, we can work shoulder to shoulder with schools that we start to see these gaps before the annual IEP meeting that we come in and that we're able to support just in time. So if something's not working, we can help schools with that and provide that differentiated coaching um, so that our students can make progress. Because here's the thing, students will move at different rates of progress. But what we always want to see is movement forward, um, no matter how small. And if our students aren't moving forward, we need to know on a regular basis so that we can um, put in place whatever supports are necessary so that students can continue their growth. So, um, and but but this, were you sorry? With this one, we have a the opportunity to train a district trainer, correct? Yes. So this be, one does. And we'll, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I just go ahead. That was it. I was going to say yes. So this one does give us the opportunity and we actually are really fortunate that uh, Miss Wise jumped on that opportunity um, immediately and you heard her journey actually did begin with Miss Bowman um, and her and her passion for um, serving students with dyslexia that have intense reading needs. Um, however, what um, is provided through MZ is this opportunity to get a fully um, certified district instructor um, that can do um, they have to, you know, be series certified. You have to pass the certification exams. Um, there, uh, there are many, many, many hours complete a practicum, a six to nine month practicum. Um, you have to be coached. You have to, you know, complete assignments um, and, you know, then ultimately work towards that district certification. And so this will allow us to really have a sustainable plan over time. Um, and so this is just a start. And, you know, uh, we will continue to grow and refine and get feedback about what is and isn't working. But what I did hear from teachers when I first came in the district a lot, there were a couple of pain points. And one of the pain points was around um, that there just wasn't enough structure with, with tier three reading interventions. And so uh, we really want to make sure that we have in place, uh, we, want student, we want teachers to feel successful so that students can be successful. And so that is one of the reasons that this is helping us make sure that there is uh, a coach in place that is um, certified to work with other teachers um, in the Orton-Gillingham methodology. 
So are, are we working under the assumption that all Orton Gillingham curriculums methodologies are the same? So at the heart of OG or Orton Gillingham methodology, they are very similar in the base. And so um, what you want to then really look at is um, the implementation of it. So when you look for a, a, a different a vendor, that's going to provide that. And there's many, there's many, 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 many vendors is that you need to look and and to be really honest in a district our size, um, you know, we want to think about sustainability over time. Um, and so, yes, for us, you know, having um, the ability to have a district certified instructor that we will be able to have in place in the 25-26 school year is definitely um, a win for us, a win for our students, um, because we want to ensure that every um, student um, has a highly qualified and trained um, teacher in front of them. And this allows us to provide that coaching that we have not been able to do in the past. Um, additionally, you have to look at what other structures are in place. Are there structures to train paraeducators? Are there structures to, to train administrators? Are there structures to continue to deepen your knowledge, right? So once you have the base training, I, I agree with you that the components are going to be very similar in nature. But then what are the resources to support the implementation? Are there other courses in terms of fidelity, in terms of coaching, in terms of um, even if you want to learn more about dyslexia, what are the other pathways to support that? Because here's the thing, we don't want a one and done training. We want to see what is that comprehensive plan over time. And what I will tell you is, um, even though I was just trained four years ago, before I would, if I were to go back to the classroom tomorrow, I would have to have a refresher course. I would not feel that I was ready to sit down with students until I would made sure that I had the fluency I needed to be in front of kids. And so, um, did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Uh, what I'm trying to say is because, I mean, just we're, we're, I mean, that's kind of the way this is being presented that because it's working under the OG um, methodology that, you know, we're not replacing an OG, we're, we're just moving forward. So are we under the assumption that because it's OG methodology, this they're the same? It's that they're all the same. Ms. Kraft, I can speak to that for a moment if you'd like. I, basically, Orton-Gillingham methodology means that you are using a multi-sensory approach. So with every activity that's happening, you want the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and mouth to be involved because the more pathways that are used, then the more neural pathways that can be firing in your brain to take that student that has dyslexia. And as they said, dyslexia is a phonological module that is having difficulties in the brain, it is not a thinking disorder whatsoever. So um, the more pathways that you are able to create, you can do that using a multi-sensory approach. Every program, Fran's pro program, this program, MC, it has a different scope and sequence, and it has a different way to do things. So for example, when you start with Fran, you are starting each lesson drilling the flashcard that has the um, name of the letter on there, and the students will just say, mm, if you're showing M. With MC, they actually do a three-part drill with that. You flash the card, they say the sound, and then you take sand and you say, eyes on me, spell mm, and they take the sand and say, M says mm, and they write it in the sand. And then they take those cards that you had flashed and I put them into piles. I then put them on a blending board that they provide and they're blending. So their drill is incorporating the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and you know the verbal pathway um, just to do your drill in the beginning of the lesson. So like I said, the methodology of OG is rooted in using as many senses as possible to try to get students to learn, which would, yes, benefit any student. Um, this program, however, I said has three just in that first part of the outline of their lesson, which is called the three-part drill. I don't know if Thank that really you. answers or clarifies that at all. Ms. Booker Dwyer, did you have a question? Yes, um, I just had a just a follow up because I feel like um, we're, what I'm hearing, at least from Ms. Dominowski's line of questions, is that I'm just wondering if um, the, the, the root questions are what are the components that we want to see or the, met, method, or the methods that we want to see 
from a particular program and then to ask, does the program that's being presented to us have it? Because um, I feel like we're getting too caught up on, is it OG? Is it I, like what, what's involved in it? Does it have it? Are we, ha is this something we can move forward with to help um, with our students? And so um, I do think what's presented now, and I, I don't want us to get caught up on, on ours because I, I love the point that was made that it's about the quality um, and not so much the time on task. And so, and if we're seeing, um, and if we're hearing back from educators who are actually using it, saying that it's working, I feel like this is something that we can um, move forward with. And then perhaps, in the future, we could just have some clear criteria of what is it that we agree as a board that we want to see from programs like this and then use that as the measure instead of getting caught up on um, a name of the particular program. Thank you. That was just a comment, correct, Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yeah, yeah, just a comment. Right. And I just have a quick question. When we talk about tier three, like you said before, it's really the conditions around the instruction that will elevate the use of OG as a tier three intervention. So the number of kids in the group that the, the teacher's working with, the length of each session, the number of times per week, um, and the resources provided and the amount of progress monitoring. That is also part of a principal's work to ensure that that is happening in a building. So, so part of making sure that it goes to a tier three level is that principal working with their special educator or department chairs to ensure that those conditions are met. How will you be conveying that information to our principals to help ensure that it truly is a, a tier three intervention. Dr. D. Donato, do you want me to start? You can go ahead, Dr. Kraft. I know, she knows I'm excited. So I've been asked to uh, present at the uh, principal um, professional learning this summer in July um, around literacy intervention um, specifically. Um, and we are going to be talking about what we are looking for and what what an intensity of a tier means. Um, and then some of the things that they should be considering. Um, additionally, we are going to have that new progress monitoring in place um, that principals will learn about also. Um, and then on top of that, we are going to ask that all administrators participate in um, an OG training specifically. And so while they have already done um, a minimum of six hours of, of science of, of reading training, some of them have uh, closer to 16 hours, um, we're now going to layer on top of that, well, what would it look like if I um, go into an OG classroom and see it being done with fidelity? What are the things I should be seeing? Um, and so we will continue to communicate the things that make something intense of, which like you said, you you hit on them, right? So it's the size of the group. Um, it could even be the time of the day. It could be um, the person that's working with the individual, um, the, you know, the the materials being used. So there's, there's a variety of things that we look at uh, when we say that it is a tier three. And so that will be part of our uh, multi-tiered system support um, literacy handbook. Um, so in addition to getting that professional learning, they will have something that they continue to look back on and, re you know, refer to as they are making those um, decisions. And, and so we're really excited. We've been partnering with principals. We actually were with them once a month this year. Um, we're going to continue uh, really making sure that they have what they need to make those decisions in a way that fully support our most vulnerable readers. Thank you, because we can have high quality program, but if we don't have those conditions met, it's still not going to show us the gains that we're looking for. Um, Ms. Wise, I want to thank you also for being part of this meeting and to provide your perspective as a teacher. That, that is huge for us, um, so I appreciate that. Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call vote, okay. please, on the contract for ISME? Sure. Um, Ms. Pumphrey? No. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? No. Ms. Stolowski? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. So I will let the Building and Contracts Committee know that it was not recommended um, by the board, and then they will go forward from there. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for all of the work that you put into helping us understand this better. Um, and again, um, Nicole, thank you so much for, for being at this meeting. You're welcome. Next on the agenda is the curriculum committee schedule for 2024-2025. Um, and that was posted on board docs also up oh, and it's also up there. Thank you, Ms. Cox. 
Um, my only concern was December that there is no meeting. I know that's been typical, but last year we did have to add it. So I don't know whether it's better to add and delete versus having to add it later and trying to figure it out around everybody else's schedules. So um, any other comments about either what I said or the schedule that's here? Ms. Dominowski, is your hand up? Yeah, I was going to say it might be good to schedule it early in December and then if you know now yeah. have it on the book so we can plan for it because we do need the time. OK, I agree. Thank you. So Dr. DiDonato, if that's OK with your staff, could you work to add one more meeting on that schedule? Sure. And looking at sort of our pattern of uh, meetings, we're typically, except for November, we're in the second week in November. Um, but for December, would we want to do the 5th or the 12th? Is there a preference? The first um, Thursday. I don't even know what I'm doing next week. I can't tell you what about the about December. Both are available according to the little draft calendar that I have of okay. all of all committees. Both all right. are open, so if we want one, we can pre well, What were the out. two dates again? What were the two dates? December fifth or twelfth. Both of them. I would are go with the fifth before it gets too crazy for everybody. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay, any other comments or questions about the um, schedule for next year? Okay, I don't think we need any motion for that. So we will go on to the next topic, which is discussing and answering any questions about the 2023-2024 spring phase forms. Um, so the information was provided. I did not do a voiceover PowerPoint because it's pretty self-explanatory about courses that are being um, discontinued um, the deletion process, which is, you know, the elimination of a course, um, as well as some courses that are being added. The courses that are being added, um, just a couple highlights, um, are the ones really linked and aligned with um, us being able to better track and monitor. Uh, next slide. Uh, one more, Ms. Cox, sorry. There we go. Um, that really help us align and better track uh, both our students um, when they're receiving services, as well as um, who is providing them. We'll be able to see, you know, who's in that group um, with that teacher. So these additions are really to help us um, better monitor interventions that are provided uh, across content. So both reading as well as math, um, our multilingual learners, as well as our spe students receiving special education services. And for our targeted assistance Title I schools, um, this part of the targeted assistance process is really being able to evaluate um, how targeted intervention uh, changes outcomes with small groups of students. Um, this will really allow us to better uh, be able to monitor that. So that those would be just some of the highlights of uh, courses being added. Are there any questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, is this something we have to vote on, um, Dr. DiDonato? It is a voting item, yes. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the 2023-2024 spring phase forms? So move Stolowski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Move a roll call vote, please. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? She's all left, I think. I think she may have um, had to leave the meeting. Uh, Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Ms. Licker? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last item on the agenda is the iCivics program. And there was a PowerPoint on board docs about this also, but um, I'm going to mess up your name. I've been practicing and now it's reaching a blank. Danny? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's Bian Dr. Biancoli. Dr. Biancoli, I'm yep. sorry. No problem. I answer to any variation. So we're good. I'm sure you do, but I was trying to get it right and then I went blank. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay. Um, 
Are there so, any questions? Yeah, are there you just any want questions? to give us a summary? I'm not sure if we had this before. I've lost track about. No, uh, okay. no. I think this we were, was one that we. It's been on the agenda a couple times, so it's like Jar. So we okay. we thought, well, we'll try it again this. Okay. Time. So first, thank you for for being patient <laughs> with us as we pushed you a little bit to the side. But here we are. So the floor is yours. No problem. Um, so we wanted to just bring to you a um, an opportunity that we have to work with iCivics, which is a um, national nonprofit around civic education that was founded by Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, typically, we've used them as a supplemental resource in our um, American government curriculum, but they have been working under a U.S. Department of Education grant to develop a core U.S. history course um, that would align with our eighth grade American history. So it's that first half up to about 1877. Um, it's what students are assessed on on that grade eight social studies assessment. Um, and so they have brought this opportunity to us for a uh, no cost pilot to us that provides our teachers with a great deal of um, a great deal of support for a inquiry based uh, literacy focused social studies curriculum. So it very much aligns with the direction that we have been moving with social studies uh, for the last number of years but with a level of support and um, detail that we often don't have the capacity to provide. So um, in terms of allowing teachers, instead of focusing on the um, creation of materials, it's providing that and allowing teachers to really focus on scaffolding, on meeting students where they are, on developing those critical reading, writing, and argumentation skills that we know are so important to them moving forward. Um, and so this would be a pilot in five to six of our middle schools, looking at um, whole eighth grade teams so that it would still allow us to do the PLC work that we know Dr. Rogers um, is tasking us with for next year. Um, and also allow us to sort of see how this would work with students in various parts of the district. Um, so that then we can provide uh, some feedback, some assessment to see if this is something moving into 25, 26 that we would want to incorporate for all of our middle schools. So I don't know, I don't want to go into too many details because I know you had the PowerPoint there, but um, if there are questions or places you would like me to speak further, just please let me know. Okay, are there any questions from board members? Ms. Stileski, are you trying to, Ms. Stileski, go ahead. Thank you. Um, if you can just um, highlight any feedback from other school districts that have either piloted this program or actually implemented it, that would be amazing. Sure. So there is a slide that actually provides you um, with a few of the snippets, but in general, the uh, let's see when we get to it. In general, the feedback, here we go, uh, from teachers is that this has really helped to shift the focus in the class to engage students in a way that um, they might not normally be with a more traditional style of social studies instruction. It's really shifting that focus so that students are involved in interrogating sources and helping to provide uh, meaning around big picture questions. It's something that is currently being piloted and you can see those districts primarily um, west coast into the Midwest. And so this is their, that was the last, that was last year and this year they're moving um, into a few more districts on the east coast for that final year of the pilot. So what we would be receiving in terms of curriculum is something that's already been piloted and revised. Um, so we're getting the benefit of the work these other districts have done. Thank you. And I had a chance to look at the materials at one of the curriculum nights, and they're really they're they're wonderful materials. So it's it's very exciting. Other questions? Nope. Okay, may I have? Do we need a motion for this, Ms. Dr. DiDonato? So, um, no, it's we're it's at no the cost grant. to the district, right? right. Um, and it's currently going through the IRB process since it is a grant from um, USD to for iCivics that they there be research components um, that they're conducting as part of it um, to look at you know implementation and outcomes. So um, it's currently working through our IRB process. 
as well as the curriculum review process to you know further vet the materials. Um, but this was more of a awareness of this is a up and coming pilot, but again, a heads up that this might be something that next spring we're coming back to have a different conversation about um, if we are requesting to move it forward. Okay, thank you for that. Um, is there any further business at this time? Okay, hearing none, since there is no further business, um, the only announcement is our next curriculum committee, curriculum committee meeting is scheduled for June 13th. Um, Dr. DiDonato and I were not sure whether we would need that meeting, so I will work with her and let you all know as soon as possible whether we're keeping it or whether we um, will be canceling it. But thank you everybody um, for your help as always for all the prep you did with the PowerPoints um, and the answering of all the questions. So it is 5.30, look at that. So I hope everybody has um, a wonderful evening and a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.